All right, yeah, we're getting a, getting a bunch of folks. I'm gonna go ahead and, and start. So my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. We are not a normal publisher. <laughs> Someone asked me the other day, what is a normal publisher? It's a good question, I don't know. Whatever it is, we're not that. So a lot of what we do puts us at the center of the conversation around voice technology and conversational AI. So three years ago, we started a podcast network called Voice First FM, which uh, is the podcast network for this new era of voice computing that we're in, our flagship show, This Week in Voice. Um, I host that. Um, we're fortunate that a lot of people have enjoyed it and, and listened to it and watch it on YouTube. Um, springing forth out of that has been what we call the Project Voice series, which is a series of live events and industry conferences. Digital Book World is a little bit of a one-off for us. We had a chance to acquire it um, a couple of years ago. And um, as you can imagine, there's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason when a company can acquire something like that that you never heard of, um, it was in bad shape. And we took it on. Uh, we definitely thought that there was a need for a digital, a, a conference that looks at digital publishing, but uh, synthesizes that information with what's going on with print and the realization that print's never going to leave us. And so we set out, you know, after we acquired Digital Book World to, to create the best publishing conference that exists. That's, that's our goal with it. And um, we're pleased that last year uh, we had a sold out event, uh, just a who's who of folks participating and we're really proud of it. And, you know, the events this year have presented a bit of a challenge, but um, we're we're pretty creative. Uh, we're, we've already announced some guidelines that um, will elevate hygiene, health, and safety for events moving forward that we do. Um, we're about to announce some tweaks to those, so I don't want to talk too much about events. Everybody's, you know, uh, I'm going to focus on the, the issue at hand. If you want to ask me about events, uh, you can just uh, not ask and look at what we do, um, because we'll have more to, much more to say about that over May and June. Um, Thank you for joining us. So back when we did Digital Book World 2019, we wanted to do some community events just as a service. Um, not everybody can attend Digital Book World. It's expensive because it has to be. Um, it's, it's premium. Um, it's something that not everybody can go to. But we wanted uh, to, you know, for people around the world or for, for people who one reason or another can't, can't go, we wanted to do some some virtual stuff. And so it was back in last September, long before coronavirus was something we knew about, that we announced DBWFM and DBWAI just with the intention of covering some topics that were germane to the publishing community. And so today, I'm going to be talking all about voice technology in publishing. And I'm going to do it quick. Uh, there's a lot of new information here that I'm presenting for the first time, some original research. Um, that builds off of what I spoke at London Book Fair about last year. Um, that is the Forbes article that's in the chat. If you go into the chat, you, um, there's a Forbes article there. It will be a bit of an update on that. Um, so I'm going to get into it. It'll take about 40 minutes or so. Um, and then hopefully I'll leave plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end uh, for those that have it. So, um, and if you have a question, uh, by the way, there is a Q&A function of Zoom. So if you, if you write a question in the chat, I'll, I'll try to be looking at that, but I can't make any guarantees. If you write a question in the Q&A part of Zoom, which you should see in the bottom bar, at least that's what it's on for mine. Um, uh, if you put it there, I, I, that guarantees that I'll see it at the end. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hit share screen. Um, okay, I think this is, I think this is working here. Let me, um, go to slideshow and play from start. Okay, cool. And let me see if I can get the chat up. Yeah. Okay, can everybody see the screen? A couple of people saying yes will be great.
Okay, cool. With that, we'll be off and running. So here's what we're going to do. Intro, I've already given you a little bit of that. I'm going to talk who we are. Uh, if, you, if you care about that, it's in the slides. You'll get them afterward. I'm going to really breeze through that quickly. Early successes of voice technology. I'm going to paint a picture of some context across different industries, um, which is necessary to understand the role that voice is going to play in publishing. I'm going to talk about some early use cases we've already seen. Then I'm going to talk about this New York Times test for voice assistance that we came up with. Uh, that made news last year that we've updated for this year, some important takeaways there, what can and should publishers be doing now, and then we'll get to Q&A. So a little bit about us, like I said, I'm going to breeze through this stuff. Voice First FM is our podcast network. Um, today it's listened to across 56 countries by hundreds of thousands of folks, a lot of different shows, a lot of different content. This Week in Voice uh, is our flagship show I hosted. We've been fortunate to have Mark Cuban uh, join us last year. We really had a who's who of folks from technology and all sorts of different verticals uh, participate in that. I wrote an article called Your Company Needs a Strategy for Voice Technology. This was in Harvard Business Review last year. I would encourage you to check that out if this stuff is of interest to you. Um, I'm considered a top 11 influencer. I still haven't figured out if that's a compliment or an insult. Uh, we do a lot of different events, uh, most of which are, are, are orbit voice and AI. This is the main one. You know, you, you're already aware of digital book world, but Project Voice is the other one to be aware of. This is the number one event for voice and AI in America. Uh, you see coming the week after CES on there. Uh, we'll see if that is still uh, applicable. Uh, I'm not sure about big events moving forward. And Project Voice Catalyst is a brand new consulting service we've rolled out that really has gotten off to a fast start where if you or your organization need help with uh, with voice, um, we're here for you uh, and we're pretty effective at that. Okay, so there's the introduction. If you cared about that, you'll get the slides. Uh, happy to talk to you about that afterward. Um, but I, I've, I've got, got a lot to cover. I don't want to you know, focus on that too much. This term voice first, you're going to hear me use it quite a bit. And I want to talk about this a moment because it can be a little confusing, but it really speaks to the, the, the reality of why voice matters. We've all been through hype cycles of different technology. We've all been told such and such is going to be the next big thing. Um, interactive books. Interactive books will be the next big thing. And uh, a couple of years go by and it's not the next big thing and something else is. And, you know, we've all been through that stuff. And so the question is, how, how, what makes us think that voice is not going to be a gimmick like that? Well, uh, the way I think about it is, and, and the way that Brian Romley, who's, on, who's attending this talk right now, um, has guided me to think is that when we're, when we're born, all we have is our mother's voice. So those pictures on the left and in the womb, outside of the womb, it's part of our human experience. Then as we get older, this picture in the middle, um, we develop an inner voice that will guide us for the rest of our life. So it always stood to reason that as technology evolves, it would arc toward being voice driven, voice uh, oriented, what we call voice first. So there's been a number of early successes in voice already. And this is a main takeaway of this presentation. If you don't take anything else away uh, from this, hopefully you walk away with the fact that voice is not something that is down the road. It's not something that academics are pontificating about in the ivory tower and at some point it'll come out like a lightning bolt and change our world no it's changing the world now and i'm going to spend a good bit of time on this slide right here and walk through some of these things because depending on your role with a publisher or, or whatever your um position is uh within publishing or technology we've got a lot of people uh in in the zoom right now um it's important to know some context. So I want to paint you a bit of a picture here. Novel Effect, the first bullet point here. This was the first company accepted into Amazon's Alexa accelerator powered by Techstars. They went on Shark Tank. They got an offer for $250,000. They rejected it. 
to go on and raise, I think, three and a half million dollars um, a little bit uh, later. And what they do is they, the easiest way to describe their technology is that when one human being is reading to another human being, so if I'm reading to our eight-year-old son, it will, uh, yeah, uh, either the, the mobile app that they have or Alexa, Google Assistant, whatever, will hear me reading Cat in the Hat. And it will very quickly determine that I'm in chapter four of Cat in the Hat. And it will then match up this custom made soundscape, many of which are recorded right here in Nashville, interestingly enough, to it'll match up the soundscape to the live reading of the text. And it sounds gimmicky, but the findings that they've had have demonstrated that reading comprehension um, and retention of what's being read skyrockets when you marry these things up like this. So um, they've been very successful right off the bat with one of the first uh, applications of voice in the space. The Stephen King Library. So we're going to talk about a number of use cases um, as part of this presentation, but this is one I often talk about in talks I give because to me it represents the future. It, it's a very good glimpse at the future of what voice and AI will do for publishing and specifically book discoverability. And, and what Stephen King Library is, is it's the uh, joint venture or the, the production of Simon & Schuster in combination with a company called Skilled Creative that um, basically use Alexa and it will ask you a number of questions. You know, what's the most recent Stephen King book that you've read? And then it'll ask you a bunch of questions that are somewhat unrelated to, you know, seemingly unrelated to anything. And using that, it will then generate a list of Stephen King books that you ought to read next out of the 50 plus books that he's written. It's really fascinating stuff. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, but it, it has been very successful for Simon & Schuster in a number of ways. Alexa, what am I holding? So if you have an Echo Show or one of these Alexa devices that has a front facing camera, you can go up to it and say, Alexa, what am I holding? And if you're holding an, an item with a barcode, including books, it will say, uh, it'll scan Amazon's database and it will tell you what you're holding. If it doesn't have a barcode, it will do its best Shazam, you know, machine learning-ish sort of approach to try to tell you what you're holding. And this sounds like a gimmick, except when you realize that for people who have no vision, they're blind or, or low vision, as well as a number of other accessibility sort of situations, it's completely transformative. And it's by itself a reason to purchase one of these devices. So um, really important use case there that hasn't gotten nearly the attention it deserves. Alexa Guard. So Alexa Guard basically um, uses your Alexa device or devices to listen to the surroundings um, listen to your surroundings, and whether you're in your office or whether you're in your home or in your car for that matter, and uh, determine, um, you know, a number of things that could be context, context driven and helpful. Like, for example, uh, hey, we just heard a window breaking. Uh, when we hear a window breaking, you know, what do we do? Do we call the police? Uh, do we wait a little bit and then call the police? Do we call you? Do we text you? Um, and that's one example of several. It's really important for insurance, but just important for anybody doing anything with voice to know that that sort of thing is happening. Google Recorder is a audio application from Google that records audio, but it's a little bit more comp it's a little bit more intriguing than that. It transcribes text in real time, and when I say real time, I mean real time. I don't mean you know delayed or, or something that doesn't work that well. I mean, it works really well and it's offline. So you don't have to be connected to the internet. This thing records audio and it transcribes it in real time, locally offline. And that has a lot of implications for what will move, you know, transpire with voice and it opens a lot of doors. Smart speakers and college freshmen and senior citizens. So the deal with this is that, you know, it's been pretty well documented that we live 
isolated and depressed lives. You know, we live in this so-called information age, which is anything but. And, you know, the result of technology has been to, to bring us a lot of depression and, and feelings of loneliness and isolation. Two groups of people get lonely more than others. College freshmen and senior citizens. They're the, they're the high ends of the curve. And if you think about it, obviously these groups have something in common. They, they both uh, often are, are in new environments. Uh, they're meeting new people. They have limited exposure to family. Uh, they're learning new, new community rules of engagement, a lot of, lot of similarities. And for some reasons we understand, some reasons we don't understand, when you introduce smart speakers into environments with either of these groups, magical things start to take place. For college freshmen, they attend class more often. They make better grades. They're more participatory in their communities. They drop out less and they kill themselves less. For senior citizens, similar sort of thing. Um, put the smart speaker in, in each room in a senior living facility, more participation, um, you know, better adherence to drug regimens for seniors, um, less death and a lot of other ne less negative outcomes as well. Fascinating thing going on there that we're just beginning to understand. And the final one is what smart speakers have done for speech pathology. And for this, uh, I'm gonna play a video in just a moment, but what Project Understood is, it, it's important for anyone in publishing and technology or anyone doing anything you know, related to content to understand the incredible resources going in to make sure that smart speakers and, and the, you know, the voice assistants and the conversational AI is understood and capable of being used and interfaced with by as many people as possible. So it was pretty rapidly discovered that people with Down syndrome have a lot of trouble using voice assistants and smart speakers um, because they just can't easily be understood. And so Project Understood is the joint venture between Google and the Canadian Down Syndrome Society. And um, together, they have joined forces to create this machine learning process where people with Down Syndrome can read a number of sentences out loud, have it recorded, and then ingested by Google. And the end result is that Google Assistant becomes better at understanding people with Down syndrome. So I'm gonna play this video. Uh, let's hope this works. Uh, let me see if I can play it here. It doesn't look like it's playing. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pull this up on YouTube and play it. Because it's important, it's worth taking a moment. Project understood, Google. Um, all right, here's the video. Okay, I'm gonna hit pause on that and let me go back to Zoom. I'm gonna hit stop share for the moment. Okay, so you can see me. So now I'm gonna hit share on my browser and I'm going to maximize this and I'm gonna play it. Play your son! <laughs> <clears throat> I gave my voice for all kind of things. Like nailing a job interview. Meeting a cute person at a bar. Impressing you with my karaoke skills. <laughs> but I can't use it to ask about the weather. Hey girl, what's the forecast today? Sorry, I don't understand. Or call my mom when I need help. Hey Google. Because right now, voice technology doesn't always understand people with Down syndrome. Which sucks. Nobody likes to be misunderstood. Or left behind. 
I may sound different, but I still have a lot to say. So we're partnering with Google. So we can solve it together using our own voice. The more voices we have, the better the technology will get. So we can create a future where every person with Down syndrome is understood. We got this. I am teaching Google. I am teaching you go. I'm teaching Google. <laughs> Donate your voice at projectunderstood.ca. Hey, Google. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to hit, hit stop share on that. Just a remarkable, remarkable video. I'm going to go back into PowerPoint now. So thus far in this presentation, what we've done is paint a picture for um, the argument on how important voice is. So if you thought, is voice a gimmick? Is it not a gimmick? Uh, is it something that's going to be ephemeral here today, gone tomorrow? Um, hopefully, this addresses that question. <clears throat> and uh, you can clearly see the way the world's moving, which, depend, like I said, depending on the role you're sitting in, in a publisher, in a technology company, whatever it is you're doing, um, that is very important insight to have. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a number of early use cases that we've seen. And all of these are gonna be on Alexa. You know, many of these have a counterpart on Google Assistant. I just took the Alexa page. So I'm not, you know, you, if you use Google, you can find it over there too. Uh, nothing against that, it's just easier to pull their page. So uh, Stephen King Library, I've already talked about that. Um, very important Alexa skill. By the way, what is an Alexa skill? It's an app for Alexa, okay? so. If I talk about an app for Alexa, uh, Alexa skill is Amazon's nomenclature for that. Uh, similarly, Google Action is the term for a Google app. So Stephen King Library talked about that. The Wayne Investigation. So there was a movie that came out called Batman vs. Superman. This was a couple of years ago. And DC decided, um, you know what? What we want to do is use Alexa to... Um, Experiment. We're going to um, try out creating an Alexa skill because it's new and it's shiny. We're going to see what happens. So they created this thing called the Wayne Investigation. And what it is, it's a very slickly produced, audio-wise, um, narrative-driven game. And it's basically a choose-your-own-adventure sort of game that's, that's, that's you know just one big story, basically. And... Amazon was shocked. They thought something was wrong with the reporting when they saw that people were using the Wayne investigation and engaging with this choose your own adventure type story that involves Batman trying to figure out who murdered his parents. Um, uh, they, when, when they were shocked to find out that the engagement for this was about six minutes in length. So any random person using this Alexa skill and playing this game was on average using it for is between five and six minutes. Now contrast that to the previous high was like 22 seconds. <laughs> so it annihilated the previous record for engagement in terms of how long the user is, in, is engaging with the Alexa device in one sitting. And this had a lot of repercussions. Amazon immediately launched a program that it still uses now that's grown quite a bit called Developer Rewards um, to get people to develop skills uh, who are third parties. Uh, it got Amazon really serious about games, but it also got Amazon really serious about content. And um, as you think about how to use Alexa and Google Assistant and other voice assistants for your business, this is a very important data point um, you know, stop on the, on the, on the road um, to be cognizant of. Disney stories. So this is an interesting one. And, and actually this is on the front page of the Alexa skills marketplace right now. So it's got some pretty premium real estate. So this has got a number of stories to it that children can access. And interestingly, it has, you can see on the screen free to enable in skill purchases available. So this is sort of the, the language, uh, the verbiage that Amazon uses for this sort of thing. 
Um, every single Alexa skill and Google action that exists, they're all free. Uh, none of them right now cost money uh, to, to, to engage and to enable. But what they're doing is they're enabling in-skill purchases. So basically, as you can see from the screen here, and I welcome you to check this out, there's four stories you get for free. And then if you pay, I think it was 99 cents at first, and then now it's up to $9.99, like the regular price, you unlock 50 additional stories. And um, this is another frontier that's being played out right now in voice is how to monetize these things. Um, a lot of experimentations going on, and this is a critical one to follow. Amazon Storytime, Amazon uh, is, is eating its own dog food big time with Alexa. Um, every, uh, almost every single unit in the company um, is engaging with Alexa one way or another. Um, that's also an important thing to realize because um, it just shows how highly Amazon prioritizes this and uh, same thing for Google. So the, these next two examples illustrate a point I wanna make as well, which is that what we've seen with voice so far is that you know, we, we've seen some initial successes, but we've seen a real need for the creator or the company you know, creating the experience, the publisher, to tell the user when to use the, the, the app or the experience, when to engage with the device. So, because it's sitting there all the time. So you got, you know, the smart speaker sitting there, you know, sitting around the house. Um, it really helps adoption if you can marry up content to a time frame or a usage pattern. And these next two examples are part of that. So short bedtime story, this is very obvious. <laughs> when, the, uh, when the creator of this intends for you to use it um, and uh, rather than limiting this in any way, it actually um, facilitates much higher adoption when you when you create content and you you give the user you know a box to play in. This is this right here is when you should use this content um, more often than other times. The other example here is Chompers by Gimlet Media. This is probably one of the most famous Alexa skills that exists. And what this is, it's a lot of content. It's, it's some stories and um, just little anecdotal, you know, um, episodic type of content that lasts um, for two minutes. And the purpose of it is to um, serve as a timer for children brushing their teeth so that they get, get in good habits of, you know, this is how long you ought to brush your teeth. And you feel like stopping now, but the story is not over, so you best keep going. Um, and so this is another great example of this concept uh, that I encourage you to, to think about, which is as you think about how to create an Alexa skill or a Google action or some sort of voice experience that helps further your business, to, to think about how content plays um, and, and what time, you know, what day, what time, well, you know, what sort of usage you'd like for, for people to engage with what you create. So we've seen some experiments with some big publishers. This right here is a Alexa skill from Hachette um, that uh, is, is a, a pure marketing device. Um, good vibes from Penguin Random House. Uh, I think this is a particularly interesting one. Um, you know, just uh, quick hitting content. Uh, you know, what we've seen, even you know, Wayne investigation aside, most people, you know, sort of like to use smart speakers with quick hitting sort of things. That's why flash briefings have uh, been so successful and no one wants to be standing there for a long time. So something like this, I think this is a really good application. Harry Potter quiz. So, um, you know, this is something from, um, as it says, Pottermore Publishing and Audible. Uh, that's just a, a, another way for uh, the legion of Alexa device owners and Google, Google Assistant device owners to engage with content uh, outside of the books themselves. Choose Your Own Adventure. This has won a lot of awards. This is from Audible as well. Um, a lot of stories are here. Uh, and this one, they just give you a bunch of stories. They haven't experimented with, with a, a freemium model with this just yet. 
you choose Batman Adventures. So from our friends at Capstone, um, this is a another sort of choose your own adventure application um, with in-skill purchasing enabled. Um, interesting uh, combination of both marketing a story as well as uh, monetizing part of it. This, I think, is the last one I've got. Um, this is another one of these that I feel like is a best practice. The voice computing book is the name of the skill, but the actual name of the book is called Talk to Me. And uh, from James Blahos, as it says in the text there, from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt published it. And this Alexa skill is, um, you know, it's got this vague sort of description here um, that really doesn't tell you what it does. Um, but what it does is that it's got interviews from the author. It's got additional insight on each chapter from the author. It's got a quiz that's narrated by the author. It really helps strengthen the connection from the user slash reader slash customer to the author. And I think this sort of thing you're going to see much more of as well. This has been quite successful. So those are some early use cases. And what I'm going to talk about now are, you know, there's still some challenges that remain here. Um, and I want to paint you a picture between what's changed between last year and this year. And this is where uh, we'll talk about some original research that we just got done with. So last year, I spoke at London Book Fair. And uh, in conjunction with that talk, rolled out this uh, research that showed that voice assistants, uh, we used Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, which is Apple's, Bixby, which is Samsung's, and a prominent independent player called SoundHound uh, with Houndify, and um, came up with a test. We took uh, New York Times bestsellers, nonfiction and fiction, and we said, um, we're gonna ask you four questions. We're gonna ask you, and I've got this written in the PowerPoint, so you, you don't have to jot this down, it'll be in the slide deck. Um, in fact, I'll, I'm gonna turn to this. Here are the four questions. Um, what happens when you say becoming by Michelle Obama to Alexa? Does it, because that was one of the best sellers at the time we did the original uh, version of this. What does it do? Does it do nothing and say, is that a whole sentence or are you, <laughs> you gonna give me more information or does it make a noise or what does it do? So that was part of it then I want to read Becoming by Michelle Obama for each one of the New York Times bestsellers, fiction and nonfiction, we did that. We said, I want to read the book title by the book author, see what it does. Does it do something that helps us accomplish that or does it not? I want to buy Becoming by Michelle Obama uh, or I wanna buy whatever book by whatever author. Um, what does that do? And then I want to listen to Becoming by Michelle Obama or whatever the whatever the book is. So real simple stuff here. And for each one of the bestsellers, we did this across all the voice assistants. And as you can tell, um, I'm gonna see if I can, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can go back. Oh, there we go. So this article here, which I posted in the chat of the Zoom, and I'll do it again at the end, I'll include it in an email as well, showed there was huge problems. Um, Google Assistant had the highest success rate. Alexa was really mediocre. Tons of problems leading to, um, in conjunction with using some Publishers Weekly data and VoiceBot data, um, led us to conclude that, um, at least $17 million in a, very, in a very sort of conservative analysis was being missed out on. And that number would be likely to triple heading into this year. But interestingly, um, we, so our research took the list for uh, this current list. You're looking at uh, fiction here. And then here's nonfiction. So we took these five books um, for fiction, these five books for nonfiction. And we did it again for Alexa and Google Assistant. And um, the results were really 
interesting. So Alexa is way improved. So I don't know if somebody read it or they just finally got to this on the to-do list or what, but whereas 44% of the queries, it's just an awful number, especially coming from a published, you know, a, a book oriented company, um, 44% were recognized uh, last year. Uh, that number is up to 75% this year and um, really strong performance in terms of when you ask Alexa about a book um, with just basic queries, now the likelihood is that it's going to respond in a way that adds value. And that's a huge, huge outcome um, and really good to see. Um, especially can, when you consider that these New York Times bestsellers, the great thing about this list of books is that these are the most marketed, most uh, capitalized books in existence. They're getting the most love. They're getting the most attention. They're getting the most ad dollars. And if Alexa and Google Assistant can't get it right with these, there's no hope for anything else any of us, any of the rest of us uh, plebes do. So um, really good to see this result. Google Assistant is the same, but different. And I'll explain. So Google Assistant was at 72% last year, and now it's up to 75%. So a tick up, but there's a big, big caveat here. Google Assistant um, got every single thing right. If you ask, I want to read, insert name of book, insert author, um, it will get you the information. If you say, I want to buy, it'll get you information from like a gazillion vendors. If you say just the name of, you know, um, Camino Wins by John Grisham. That was, that was one of them from this time. Camino Wins by John Grisham. Google Assistant will pop up a bunch of information. It, it, it knows what it is. The, the gap here is that for every single book, when you say, I want to listen to Becoming by Michelle Obama, I want to listen to Camino Wins by John Grisham, it doesn't have a clue. <laughs> it, it wanted to send us over and over again to YouTube for videos that had nothing to do with anything. This is a major gap with Google Assistant. Um, I, some Google folks are on this webinar now. Y'all take a look at this and, and fix it, and then you'll be at 100%. So the bottom line here is that these results are good. These results are especially, they're, they're good in relative terms over last year. They're good in absolute terms. Uh, as well, and it shows the way this is all moving because um, once these voice assistants start to get these basic questions right, then the groundwork will be laid for what's to come and 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 really these voice assistants playing a much more prominent role in discoverability um, and some other things. So um, actions to take now. So this is, I get asked about this uh, a lot and so I wanna cover this. Um, if you're a small publisher, if you're a university press, if, if you're a big publisher, um, if you are an entrepreneur and you just released a book, uh, you know what, no matter what it is you're doing, if you're, if you're an educator, um, it really doesn't matter what you're doing. There's some, some actions you can take now that will benefit you. The first one, and this is not meant to sound trite or cliched or, or, or trivial, it's to start. So, as you could tell from all of the examples that I gave from Alexa use cases, as well as all the other stuff I showed earlier uh, at the beginning of the presentation, this train's already left the station. Um, there's a lot of experimentation going on now that your peers are doing, your, your competitors. Um, uh, it's, it's all happening now. And to be prepared, uh, for the future, it, you know, it really would behoove you, like if you're at a big publisher or, or if you have the resources to do so, to, to have an intern or have a young uh, junior uh, person download Alexa Skills Blueprints and just uh, on behalf of your company, create some sort of voice experience. You could do something really trivial, uh, something that doesn't matter that much. It can regurgitate information from your website. It can 
read a sample chapter from a book. It can, it can do a number of things. But what you will learn from doing that is so valuable because you'll get key insights into how these ecosystems work. And even better, there's a, there's a new reason now to do it. You know, it, it, inherently there's reason to do it because you see the way, this is the way the world's moving. And this is the interface that people will be using for computing. Um, you know, the dominant interface moving forward, not necessarily the exclusive one, but a dominant one. So that's a reason by itself, but a sort of a newer reason is that these bigger companies like Amazon, these most of the tools that that are available, many of which are free, they don't cost anything. Um, like Alexa Skills Blueprint, that tool doesn't cost anything to use to create an Alexa skill. These tools now give you access to data that you didn't have before. So, for example, you might create an Alexa skill, like think about the Alexa skill for Talk to Me, that book that I was mentioning at the very end. Um, the, the name of the skill was the voice computing book and the name of the actual book was Talk to Me. So if you create an Alexa skill for that, that serves as sort of a marketing front door, a marketing device, and you start to see from the data that people are asking, how do I buy this? How do I buy this? How do I buy this? And within the skill experience you've created, something's amiss and it's not connecting the dots properly. Boy, that's really valuable insight. If you see, I want to buy this from Bookshop. I want to buy this from Bookshop. I want to buy this from Bookshop. Well, uh, you might want to think about allowing people to buy it from Bookshop. <laughs> uh, all, all the things that people say to these devices, that data you could never have before. And now all you have to do is create an Alexa skill and give it some meaningful functionality and drive some traffic to it using your existing marketing channels. And it will really have potential to give you some keen insights that you didn't have before. So I encourage you to, to have a bias toward action with voice rather than uh, a wait and see approach. Number two, leverage existing audio content. So this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily think about, but you know, there's so much audio content being created, whether it's audio, whether it's podcast interviews that authors are doing or publishing executives are doing, and then uh, produced audio that goes into voice experiences as well. You got all this audio and seeing, we've seen less experiments with this, but uh, I think this is fertile ground for creativity that publishers, uh, you know, forward publishers can bring is how can you leverage all of this audio content and monetize it. And one of the most obvious ways to do that is to take language that's more out of the movie industry where, you know, you go and buy a DVD or a Blu-ray and, you know, a lot of times you have a regular edition, you have a premium edition and the premium edition has extra content. Well, you can do the same sort of thing with audio books um, where, or even with voice experiences too, where you can have some content available for free and then if you're willing to pay an extra 99 cents or a couple bucks or whatever it is, you can unlock a whole slew of other content, including, and here's where you reinsert all of that recorded content that you've already created and leverage it again. So um, something to think about uh, for sure. And then number three, forge relationship with Amazon, Alexa, and Google Assistant teams. This is really important, especially for publishers who have a hate, hate relationship with Amazon. Um, I'm going to stop the share just so you can see me. So uh, and we're, I'm about to start taking some questions, uh, but I'll put up my contact information in a minute. The thing about the publishing world, a lot of people hate Amazon. That is a position of luxury. The thing that you're going to find is that the way that Amazon is set up, and I, I'm, I'm not here to defend Amazon. I'm not, I'm not really down with defending you know, trillion dollar companies. They don't need my help. But what, you, what you're going to find is that if you don't, as a publisher, take advantage of Alexa and Google Assistant as well, that um, the content that you're creating is not going to be seen as by as many people. And we're only at the precipice of that. Uh, soon we'll have more contextual Alexa and Google Assistant that will have access to your calendar. They'll have access to your purchasing history. They'll have access to your podcast listening history, your audio, your, your music history, and they'll know you. 
And when that happens, the, the way that these voice assistants will be able to recommend and uh, service a front end for discoverability for readers is it, it's not gonna make the search engine completely obsolete, but it will make it mostly obsolete. <laughs> and you know the time horizon for that is you know probably the next three or four years. So, and it might be here sooner. So if your content is not within Amazon's, uh, where, where Alexa can find it and where Google Assistant can find it, then you better have another way because um, a lot of people are gonna be using those uh, who ordinarily might have gone to the web and you could have caught them with an ad, you could have caught them with SEO and you won't be able to do that anymore. So um, forming a relationship with uh, the folks, um, you know, the silo within Amazon that deals with Alexa and the folks at Google who deal with Google Assistant, it will only benefit you um, even if you may have an issue with something that's gone on in the past or some other business practice going on elsewhere in the company. So with that said, I'm going to go back to, let me see here. I'm going to put my contact information up on the screen and then I'm going to take questions. So I'm going to go back to share screen and I'm going to hit this. I'm going to go play from current slide. This is my book. If you care, it's on Amazon. Um, and this is me. So if you want to reach me, that's my email address, my Twitter handle. Um, want to put flash that up on the screen. Would love to hear from you. Uh, hit me up. Happy to help you however we can. So after showing that, everybody attending the presentation will get the audio, the video, and the slide deck. I'm going to open up for questions. So I'm going to go to the Q&A. Um, I got Rob F. saying, break a leg. OK, thank you. Um, from Ricardo Posadas, would you give us some okay, links to get to the Stephen King Library and how to access it? Honestly, uh, the, the easiest way to do that is to just go to Google and Google Stephen King Library Alexa, and it'll pop right up. I could, I could post the link. It'd be like a gazillion characters long. Uh, that's the easiest way to do that. Um, Independent audiobook services, I'm, I'm going to read this, this out loud. Um, it seems like more of a comment than a question. I'm going to read it anyway. Independent audiobook services on smart speakers would be great. People with low vision subscribing to specialized nonprofit library services are waiting for that. Do you know of any successful independent service of this kind? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's been some forays into voice, uh, I think, by Libro. Um, I know Find a Way um, is is uh, doing some work in it as well. I can't speak very well to how far down the road they are. Uh, if that's something you know about, uh, feel free to chime in in the comments. Um, we worked on a Google Home prototype last year, but faced technical issues which blocked us. Issues had to do with advanced user interactions during long audio tracks. Yeah. Now both Alexa and Google Assistant have made significant changes over the last, I would say, 30 months, certainly last, last two to three years, to um, enable longer form content. And one of the most meaningful ones on the Alexa side just happened a couple of weeks ago where Amazon rolled out a new voice for Alexa that is uh, that has intonation and other properties that design it more for long form narrative. And it didn't get a lot of press, didn't get a lot of people covering it, but um, you can see that's just one bullet point of several that sort of points toward Amazon and Google Assistant both understand that for many people, these voice assistants are just content delivery devices. And uh, they're continuing to work on that. And one of the things is what you mentioned in your comment, which is uh, needing to have longer audio. And so already the amount of audio that can go through AWS or through Google and be part of these experiences is way greater than it used to be. And they're continuing to work on that. Can you speak to the popularity of podcasts and how publishers should or shouldn't jump on that train? So yes, I can. Um, the, um, the story that I use is that three years ago when we started Voice First FM, this, the green, thing in the top left corner of the logo, you know, behind me. 
Um, that's our podcast network. And, you know, back in 2017, I had the thought, aren't podcasts played out? Like, why would I do that? But it feels like I missed the boat. And I had a conversation with Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a well-known marketing guy, um, and was able to, to meet him uh, at an event that was uh, in, here in Tennessee. And, um, and I asked him, this is back in 2017, uh, in April 2017, I asked him, it feels like I missed the boat with this. It's like people are going to be asking about voice now. I feel like I missed the boat with this. You know, should I just catch the next thing and not worry about a podcast? And he said, no, and stop talking like that. Go start. The, it, it, it's, it's just now getting going. And, you know, three years later, we've reaped a lot of benefits from the content we create and the content we produce and share with the world. Um, it, it's, it's our way of shining a light on interesting people doing interesting things. It's opened a lot of doors for us. And um, I would say that if you, I, you certainly should do it, uh, not to go down too far down this rabbit hole, but yes, you should absolutely do it. The key thing to think about is what can you deliver on six months from now, you know, down the road? You're, you're full of energy now. You can do a bunch of stuff now, but you're going to get tired of it. Uh, life is going to start to get in the way. Can you realistically deliver on one podcast a month? Um, one podcast a quarter, a couple a quarter. Take whatever you think you can do, cut it in half, and then let that be your initial schedule. Because um, the key thing with podcasts is consistency. And um, much more so than production values. No one cares. Uh, they, they'll say they care, but they don't. The audio quality. Um, what they care about is the consistency. And so if you can deliver, 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 um, even when it gets hard, that's, uh, if you can do that, then absolutely you should move forward. Um, the next question is, it seems the voice is working well with a dedicated device. Any thoughts why? How is it better than having it on your phone? So this is a major misconception of voice. Um, that the number one use is through smart speakers. Uh, it's not. The number one use is on the phone in the car. So, and it's, it's, it's a significant difference. It's a, it's a significant gap between that and, and usage in the home, which is number two. So no, the car is actually the number one place where voice technology is used. And uh, then the home is number two. And so whether it's through smart speakers or whether it's the voice assistant embedded on your mobile um, or soon, voice assistants embedded in uh, wearables like headphones or, or, or glasses or, or even your clothing, because we're getting to that point. Um, voice is going to be everywhere. There's nothing special necessarily about the device. And, and actually, it's very helpful to not think about the device and think more in terms of just the engagement between the voice experience and the user. Um, OK, so I think that's all the questions. Um, I do want to point out one more thing before we adjourn. Uh, there's an article. I'm going to actually post the link to it again um, here in the Zoom. There is an article from voicebot.ai that uh, I, I sort of, it was sort of implicit in my talk, but I want to make, I'm going to post it again here. So this article just from a couple of weeks ago, or like 10 days ago, talks about how Amazon's market share with voice and smart speakers, which used to be 60, 70%, like Herculean, has been chipped away, chipped away, chipped away by Google, which is now surging. And so what we're seeing emerge now is this true two horse race between Amazon and Google, and they both approach voice differently. Google's got an incredible amount of horsepower behind the underlying AI that is superior to what Amazon has. Amazon has incredible horsepower behind their customer presence and the data they have and just their history is quite a bit different. Um, and so they're, they're approaching this problem from two different vectors. But the reality is that now Google has managed to, most people would call it, kind of sort of caught up to Amazon's lead. And the benefit of that to publishers and anybody doing anything with content is that 
you don't like what Amazon's doing, you hate them, you know, they, they mistreated you or whatever the case may be, you can go to Google. And uh, you don't like what Google's doing, they, they, something wrong with them, go to Amazon. The, com the competition in the space, and soon we'll have Apple, say, what Samsung's doing with, with Bixby is very relevant just beyond the purview of this webinar. Uh, and then we, there's a lot of other independent voice assistants too. But the fact that Amazon and Google are now on what most would call relatively equal footing is very advantageous for making sure that publishers of content of all sorts of different types have got the maximum number of doors open to them. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. And having Amazon and Google be forced to compete and forced to innovate and forced to act with urgency rather than the, the opposite um, will yield a lot of fruit for all of us. Thank you for being part of this webinar for DBWFM. Thank you for being part of the Digital Book World community. We're, we're honored to, uh, to get to know you. And, and certainly if you have questions or comments from this webinar, you've got my email address. Everyone will get the audio, video, and the slide deck soon. Um, we appreciate setting, you setting some of your time aside during a very busy time to be part of this with us. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you soon.